Dear viewer, what you are about to watch is a video about how Crash Bandicoot 1 is much more difficult and challenging through its level and game design when compared to the rest of the original Crash trilogy, but is also a more rewarding and satisfying experience. The Crash Bandicoot series were a string of action platformer games made in the late 90s from the award-winning company Naughty Dog. Each Crash Bandicoot title has received critical praise and acclaim, with each title of the franchise sitting somewhere in the bottom half of the top 10 greatest selling PlayStation 1 games of all time, with Crash 3 Warped being the most highly scored amongst the trio. After playing through all three of these fantastic games myself, I've concluded that Crash Bandicoot 1 is without a doubt the most difficult, intuitive, and rewarding game of the three, and that's what I wanted to talk about in this video. I'll be using three main points to make my argument, each supported by evidence collected across all three Crash games to show just how exactly Crash Bandicoot 1 is the toughest and most fun. And so, this brings me to my first point. The level design, and how all the dangers are set up, creates a true trial and test of skill for the player. But by completing these, you sincerely get a sense of accomplishment that you don't quite find in the other Crash Bandicoot games. One of the levels that really stuck out to me, and was a real test, was the ninth level in the game, titled Native Fortress. This level is one of the few levels in the game that have Crash ascending upwards on a vertical scale. In fact, there aren't really many other levels like these in the later Crash games. Because you are constantly ascending, it's almost as if the player is going through a layer before reaching the point in which you ascend upwards again. So it's safe to say that this level is almost stacked in layers. The first things that the level introduces you to are the basic enemies you'll be encountering in Native Fortress, such as the turtles, the man-eating plants, and the monkey. None of these enemies are particularly new, as you first meet them in previous levels, but the first few seconds of Native Fortress introduce how these enemies function in this specific stage, which tells you just what this level is all about. After these foes, you take two jumps onto two slanted moss platforms. You then notice that your run speed and trajectory can be taken off course while on these platforms. It isn't too much of a bother though, as there aren't any enemies or other obstacles in the way, so you move onward, while remembering how these moss platforms function. And from there, the next two important, problematic dangers show themselves. A spiked pole which extends and retracts on a timing basis, as well as a bouncing bonfire-like trampoline, which will ignite and then halt on a specific timing basis as well. These aren't quite difficult either at first, as it's just shown right in front of you. But it's at this point that you begin to see all the elements that comprise the overall level. This is just the first layer of the stage, and it serves as an introductory route. It quickly teaches the player how the obstacles and enemies behave, and how, at a basic level, Crash can overcome them. Immediately afterwards comes the second layer, which then begins to toss out different combinations of these dangers side by side. Slightly harder than the last layer, but because you learned how to deal with all of these on an individual scale, now it's up to you to combine your knowledge and abilities to proceed. This type of level design is meant to be intuitive for the player, to learn and to grow, and to improve their platforming precision and timing. Native Fortress rarely throws a curveball at you. In the second layer, you're shown something that wasn't in the first layer, which is the shielded native, but you've faced off against one before in the past. Nevertheless, you're trained as to how this enemy functions this time around, and from the third and last layer onward, you're just thrown into a full-blown obstacle course of everything you've overcome thus far. See, Crash Bandicoot doesn't try to cheat you or make things unfair. They give you all the elementary information at the beginning of the level and slowly introduces you to how each of these factors change as they begin to meld together in difficulty. You technically have all the puzzle pieces from the get-go, it's just a matter of figuring out for yourself how to put it all together and succeed in the level. It's a hardship without a doubt, 
but such an exhilarating and enthralling experience when you've at last made it to the warp plateau at the end of the level. This is that feeling of reward that I mentioned earlier, and this formula is self-evident across numerous levels in Crash Bandicoot 1. One of the features that Crash Bandicoot 1 doesn't have is the ability to save on a regular basis. Both Crash 2 and Crash 3 have dedicated save points from the hub world, the warp room. That isn't to say that you can't save your progress at all in the first game, it's just that the means in order to save require completely different prerequisites. In order to save, the player would have to either collect a gem in that specific level, or reach the end of a bonus level. And herein lies the major difference between Crash 1 and its later iterations. The difference isn't that you can save the game more frequently after levels. That would be a misunderstanding. Technically, the opportunities to save are just as frequent as they are in the other two games, but the difference being that saving your memory is a hard-earned reward rather than a luxury. You'd only really want to save your game after you've completed a level, after collecting whatever crystal, gem, fruit, and lives that stage held, and from there, the player would like to then record his or her progress. While you may freely do so, without any constraints in the second and third Crash Bandicoot titles, the first game clearly has much more tougher requirements before you are allowed to save, which makes saving the game in the first Crash Bandicoot all the more sacred and crucial. In all three Crash games, after you die, you lose a life. And once all of your lives are gone, it's undoubtedly game over, as you're sent back to your last save. This would mean that in Crash Bandicoot 2 and 3, dying isn't too harsh of a punishment, as you only backtrack to the warp room again, and then back into the beginning of the level if you saved often. But as for the predecessor of the series, there's a potential of you going back several levels, or possibly even back to level 1. And this is what makes the first Crash Bandicoot title all the more challenging. Its punishment system is far more drastic, but it's not impossible to conquer. You can get around this by saving often, just through collecting a gem or completing a bonus level, which means that by using pure skill and improving your ability in this game, can you then mitigate the punishing death system Crash 1 has to offer. I believe this term is coined nowadays as Get Good. Another game that comes to mind that does this so well, and has been praised for utilizing this at its core, is the Dark Souls series. Now, in order to collect the gem, Crash needs to complete the level without dying once, and must also break all the boxes in that level. Upon reaching the end of said stage, he'd be rewarded with a gem, which automatically saves the game for you. The other method of saving is to collect three bonus level tokens, after which transports you to the bonus level. But, as any Crash fan would know, these bonus levels can sometimes be tricky as well, requiring careful planning and platforming strategies in order to complete them. It's also worth noting that you only have one shot at these levels. If you die while attempting to reach the end of the path, you're sent back into the regular level, and you've lost your only chance at saving. Although the game pushes the player to the best of their ability, it ultimately creates a more satisfying feeling at the end. Learning how to get past all the obstacles and enemies in the level takes patience and focus. Breaking all the crates without dying requires precision, and just simply making it across to the end of the bonus level and avoiding all the pitfalls, all of this truly makes you feel as if you're learning and improving your skills in this game. And the feedback for all of this is in that feeling of safety of the save screen, which is only awarded to the best players. And finally, my last point. There's a significant difference between the number of lives that Crash Bandicoot 1 gives you in comparison to Crashes 2 and 3, and I believe this also coincides with just how the game wants to work as a testament to the player's ability. 
For this example, I'm going to be referencing the first level alone in each of the three Crash Bandicoot titles. In Crash 2 Cortex Strikes Back, as I played through the first level, Turtle Woods, the game gives you a total of 13 lives, 12 if you don't count the intro route just before you're taken into the warp room. In Crash Bandicoot 3 Warped, the first level is titled Toad Village, and after completing this level, I received a total of 11 lives. This one is a bit more complicated to calculate, however, because the game has the roulette boxes. But there are three total in the first level, which means a possibility of getting three lives from them. And in Crash 1, the total number of lives I collected was only eight. Now, here's the tricky part. Crash 1's first level and Sanity Beach doesn't contain a bonus level, whereas Crash 2 and 3 do. So, if you want to calculate the number of lives outside the bonus levels, then in Crash Bandicoot 2, there's 12 lives to collect, including the one from the intro route, and only 9 in Crash 3 when you factor in roulette boxes. Keep in mind that the number of fruit attained may vary from player to player, which may result in an estimate of an extra life for each of these figures I recorded in my data. Another thing to consider is the fact that in both of the later entries, you can revisit bonus levels infinitely and collect more lives, whereas in Crash 1, once you've completed that bonus level, it's gone for good, meaning that Crash 2 and 3 can always yield more lives if you decide to grind it out in earlier levels, and then simply save, keeping a fresh, high stock on your life count, and still giving you the ability to jump back into those levels and harvest again for more. Now. I know what you're thinking. Yes, you can simply replay Insanity Beach in Crash 1 to farm for more lives, but you wouldn't be able to save your memory anyhow, and you can easily lose all of those lives on a very difficult level, and find yourself being tossed back several stages. The reason for the number of lives and this setup is simple. Crash Bandicoot 1 doesn't want to throw away lives at you like candy. Because of this understanding, that health and second chances aren't so easy to come across, you value your efforts and your attempts more highly than you do in the other Crash games. You make your one jump count, you make your one life count. There aren't so many throwaway lives in this game that you can muster out, forcing you to play more cautiously, and rightfully so. As playing more cautiously allows you to read and absorb the information of the obstacles in the level, and recognize patterns and proceed onward to figuring out how to win in said level. If the player had the ability to collect too many lives, playing the game would just devolve into a simple running and gunning approach, throwing away all of your lives until you get it right, without really understanding or learning how or why you got past that difficult jump or that tough boss. Dear viewer, you have now listened to all three of my points, and have just seen how exactly Crash Bandicoot 1 has difficulty, reward, and honor instilled into the basics of the gameplay, and I thank you for watching. Ultimately, Crash Bandicoot 1 has intuitive levels that are a real test of your skills as a player. The game doesn't give you too many ways to stock up on lives, keeping a nice balance of the overall difficulty intact and forcing players to make every life count. And of course, the save points aren't something to take for granted. They definitely are there, but they're hard to get to. The game truly wants you to succeed, and to succeed using ability, nothing more, nothing less. And when you have done so, you are rewarded with refuge that you know you cannot find anywhere else. Because of all these traits, you can most definitely see the value and strength in Crash Bandicoot, in platforming games alone. This is what game and level design is, and this is what a good game is.